Basically, what I want to talk about is this is the season of giving and receiving. I wanted to talk about making a gift for God. Do we ever really make a gift for God? We're constantly on the receiving end, but what do we do to make a gift for God? My mother told me this story. She said there was a man who was in poverty, and he begged God to allow him to win the lottery. Well, God must have agreed to allow him to do that because the man won the lottery. And he had promised God if he won the lottery, he would give one-fourth of his winnings to the poor. He would give one-fourth of his winnings to charity. I see a grin on Sand Sun Dragon, so he must know the story. But anyway, <laughs> he would give one-fourth to charity. He would keep one-fourth for himself, and the other fourth he would give to God. Well, God allowed him to win the lottery. And so, true to his word, he laid out in equal portions four stacks of the money. And he picked up the first stack and he said, God, I am a man of my word, and so I am going to give this to the poor. He said, but I don't know anybody any poorer than I am right now. <laughs> so he put the money on his pocket. Then he picked up the next fourth pile. And he said, God, being the man that I am, I agreed to give this to charity. He said, but charity begins at home. <laughs> he picked up the next fourth. And he said, well, God, I said I was going to keep a fourth. So this is mine. And he put it in his pocket. He picked up the last fourth and he said, God, I promised you I would give you a fourth. He said, so as soon as I see you, I'm going to give you a fourth. <laughs> so when in this man's mind was it, and when did he think or did even, I know God didn't, know, didn't believe he was going to give him the fourth because Personally, they were not in that kind of, he already knew the man's heart. But he allowed the man to use his will to do what he felt he could do, which was the right thing, and do as he promised to do. And in a way, indirectly, he did. But when do we personally feel that we need to make something for God? And so that idea kind of was in my mind because I wondered, where along the line could this man have made something for God and given it directly to God? And sometimes when I think about that, I think about the painting on the Sistine Chapel where God is creating Adam. And you see their fingers reaching towards one another, but they never touch. And so in the back of my mind, there was this idea that it actually is impossible to give anything directly to God. But then I think about another um, commentary that I saw where this group, and I don't know if they still exist, they're called the Shakers. They were called the Shakers. And one of the women was saying at that time, she said, everything they did, they did for God. And the purpose was that it was God's, no matter what. No matter where he ended up, who had it, or anything else. So in the back of my mind, there was this idea that maybe I should make something for God and deliver it to God, find some kind of way to deliver it to God personally. Now at that time, I'll tell you, I was raising four, great, four grandchildren I had a full-time job. My mother was with me. I was a homemaker. I was in church donating the way I felt I should in church. I was volunteering and um, just doing anything I thought I could do to help mankind. But I wanted to make something for God. And so I decided 
I would come up with an idea that would make me believe that I could give to God directly. And so I wrote down some criteria for myself as to what that would look like, what it would be like. The first thing was, it would be the loftiest idea that I could hold in my mind. And the loftiest idea is anything that pertains to God. So that was the first thing. The second thing was, I would do it alone. I would not have anyone help me because I wanted it to be my essence. If someone else wanted to make something for God, it could be their essence. But I felt this would be mine. This would be just between me and God. The next thing is that I would start from scratch. So I didn't know exactly what material I would use, but it had to be something endurable or something that was long lasting. And so the idea of wood or stone or something like you see most of the idols made out of or icons or whatever. So I thought it would have to be that. And then I got to thinking, well, if I made a table for God, I'd have to chop down the tree. Well, that wasn't likely to happen. I could go out and pick up wood, but I wanted to do all of this on my own. So I finally came up with the idea I would make a dress because I do see God as mother, father, God. I had both parents. And so that idea came. And then I said, not only that, but each stroke would be a masterpiece because all of my effort, all of my thoughts, all of my ideas would be on this one tiny little thing that would go straight to God, this stroke. Not the whole thing. I wasn't looking at the whole thing because I knew I would never finish it. And I would never finish it because God is eternal and everything about God is eternal. So there would not be a beginning or an end to this. I would just start doing it. I wouldn't have any timing. I wouldn't have any obsessions with it. I would just do this thing and focus on God. So I had the material, needle and thread, and I said, <clears throat> as long as my mind and my attention is on God, I would sew. When it stopped being on God, I would stop. And I would not set a date or a time or any schedule. It would just be when this inclination came. And so I sat down with this material in a sacred spot and I stitched it. And um, I was working alone because, oh, the other thing was there would be no machinery involved. So it would not be on a sewing machine. It would be my internal timing. So I sat down with this thing, this masterpiece, and I went to work on it. And I worked, and I worked, and I'd come and go and do whatever else I had to do, and I'd come and go. And then one day it occurred to me, this was the most tedious thing I'd ever done. I was absolutely sick of that thing. <laughs> and when I looked at it one day, the stitching was all off. The sleeve, one sleeve was longer than the other. <laughs> it had a big bunker in it and all the material looked like it had been dragged through the mud. I said, God, what happened to this? <laughs> And then one day I found I couldn't find it. I had to hunt it up and I finally found it and looked at it and it looked even worse than it did when I first lost it. I thought, you know, I wouldn't give this to God and I know I don't I can't imagine God wanting it and I don't know if anyone I would have given it to. And it all of a sudden occurred to me that I had set parameters for what the gift was I would give to God. I had determined for myself what my gift was to God. The thing is, the gift that we give God is of our own making. It is who we are. We are God's gift to himself, or his or herself. And we are always, the more we work and strive to become that person who can touch the fingers of another person, we are personally touching God. There's no distance between us and God. Sitting in this room, not touching anyone, we're in direct contact with God. 
and everyone who puts their two fingers together is still touching God. Sometimes we think we have to do more, we have to be more, we have to be, you know, we're, we're going to outcreate God, we're going to outdo God, we're going to make more than God. It's not possible. But whatever you're doing, you're doing for God. Even when you're making the mistakes, that's a learning process. Now, the person who lost out in this library was the guy who had all the money. He actually had lost the spiritual growth that he was being challenged with. And sometimes when we think we're playing these games and you know coming up with all of these ideas, the most we can do is what we do for one another. That's what we're doing for ourselves. And that's who we're making for God. We are making ourselves for God. There's no better calling. There's nothing better you can make. There's nothing better you can do. There's nowhere you can go. There's nobody better you can be. You're already in the making for God. And that's the gift we're making for God. So I hope that helps someone. I hope that stops us from driving and striving and thinking we got to be a better person or do better. We're always trying to strive and drive to do that. That's a part of our makeup. That's the desire that's built within. And there's nothing closer to you than the indwelling presence of God. So again, I hope that helps someone. And uh, I thank you and blessed be.